Welcome to Printing the Record, Broad's Artist in Residence on Turning Scientific Data into Artist Books. I am Shannon Humphreys. I, along with my partner, Nora Long, manage the operations of the Artist in Residence program at the Broad Institute. Art and science are ways that we try to explain our place in the world and tackle unanswered questions. Broad's Artist in Residence program allows leading scientists and forward thinking artists to communicate and learn together and benefit both art and science. Today, we are pleased to present our current artist in residence, Ben Denzer. Uh, I'm not gonna read it to you. You can read and you may have already read Ben's impressive bio at broad.io uh, broad slash artist books. Ben has uh, a rather unusual residency at the Broad. His appointment began early last year uh, and we had just installed a small exhibit of some of his artist books to introduce him to the community. When the pandemic hit and many Brodies, including Ben, uh, began what would be months of remote work. Ben persisted, however, and he was able to attend uh, artist talks and connect with scientists virtually. And last fall, when some of the Brodies were able to return to Broad part-time um, with pest and mask and distance re restrictions, of course, uh, ben took the opportunity to return to uh, his in real life residency um, and uh, he began making books. Uh, two of the books that he made uh, have been um, uh, recently acquired by the University of Oxford and we are very excited for Ben to explain to us what an artist book is and show us what he's been doing and working on at the Broad. I'm gonna turn it over to him and let him get started. Um, if you have questions during his talk and we will do Q and A after the talk as well. Um, but if you have questions, pop them in the Q and A um, and uh, we'll just get started on our end. Welcome, Ben. Great, thanks so much, Shannon. Um, super excited to share the work, you know, I've been making as an artist in residence here at the Broad. Um, but before I do, just a big thanks to you, Shannon. Um, and to Todd Golub for you know welcoming me into this community. It's been such a pleasure getting to talk to Brodies, um, learning about you know their research and the amazing science that's that's happened here. So before I jump in to talking about the work that I've been making, the books that I've been making as a resident, I first wanted to give and share a little bit of context about myself. Um, so I'm an artist, designer, and teacher, and a lot of what I do kind of revolves around books. So I have this hat that says books, so I can stay on brand when I'm out and about. Um, I design book covers. I worked for a period of time at Penguin um, as an in-house book cover designer. Um, so these are some book covers that I've designed. I also frequently make editorial illustrations that often revolve around books. So these are some spots in the New Yorker. Um, books is kind of like famous chairs some other you know, book-related editorial illustrations. And then I'm a huge fan of ice cream. Um, so I have this Instagram account called Ice Cream Books where I put ice cream on top or below books or inside of books and photograph the results. And it kind of started one summer as a joke and then it's something I kind of continued and continued. And now I have way too many photos of, of ice cream on, on books. Um, but I also you know, make my own books um, by hand, and that's kind of what led me to the Broad. I make artist books and publish them under the name Catalog Press. And the work I've been doing at the Broad has been kind of a part of this larger Catalog Press um, project. And so you know, the title of this talk, Printing the Record, Broad's Artists in Residence on Turning Scientific Data into Artist Books. Sorry, I just thought that chat was for me for a sec. Um, the, the title of this talk, Turning um, Scientific Data into Artist Books, I first wanted to kind of dissect what this term artist books means, because I know it's probably unfamiliar to, to a lot of you. So when you hear the term artist books, you probably you know, are confused and you think of all these other terms that you might have heard of. Well, you know the term artists, you know the term books. Um, you, know, you might think of, uh, you know, maybe you've heard of small press or, or editions or multiples. And so the term artist books is really, you know, like painting or, or sculpture, but just another medium or a category of art. So I wanted to kind of define it and then share kind of some of my artist books and then the work I've been doing here at the Broad. Um, so the best definition I, you know, kind of have for artist books is this, which is a book or book-like object that does not describe or reproduce artwork, but is an artwork in and of itself. 
And by book like, I don't mean, you know, an artist book has to look like what we understand as a typical book. You know, there are lots of attributes that make up a book. A book has often has a narrative or sometimes a book has, has a sequence. If this is still a little confusing, I'm going to explain this in a, in a few different ways. Um, so another way to think about this is um, with this kind of graphic or, or, or diagram, which has content on one side and form and concept on the other side. And so the former concept of an artist book is as or more important than its contents. So if you think of a typical book, you know, content, the kind of word or the story is the most important thing. For artist books, the form or the concept behind, you know, the, the book becomes as or more important than the, the content itself. And if this is still confusing, I'm going to give some concrete examples. So these are two books, both published in 1969. On the left, we have Kurt Vonnegut's Slaughterhouse-Five. Um, and on the right, we have Dieter Roth's Literature Sausage, which Dieter Roth is an artist who took a sausage recipe and took a book and ground up the book and used the, the book ground up pages instead of meat and used the rest of the sausage recipe and made a sausage using this book. So just to start with this Slaughterhouse-Five, this is the first edition of Slaughterhouse-Five with this beautiful cover by, by Paul Bacon. This is what the book kind of looked, looked like. When I was in high school, I you know, was assigned to read Slaughterhouse-Five, and this is the Slaughterhouse-Five copy that, that I read. If you, you know, buy Slaughterhouse-Five from the official kind of penguin copy today, this is what that book looks like. And I show you these three different you know, versions of Slaughterhouse-Five to make the point that you know, these are all um, different objects. You know, they have different sizes, different pages, they look different, but we consider them all to be Slaughterhouse-Five. You know, it's the story, it's the content that makes them what they are. Um, and that's kind of what puts them on that left side of the spectrum of, you know, the content being the most important. We consider them to be kind of typical books. You know, this is the Amazon Kindle version of Slaughterhouse-Five. This is the Apple eBooks version. This is the Audible audiobook version. So there's not even, you know, words or characters here. It's just an audio file. Yet we consider all of these things to be Slaughterhouse-Five because it's the content that's the most important thing. You know, these are translations of Slaughterhouse-Five. Um, that look different and they all have, you know, characters and words in them, but all those characters are in different orders because they're in different languages. But again, it's the content. It's not, not like the placement of the letters. It's actually the, the story um, that make these things Slaughterhouse-Five. Now compare that with something like Dieter Ross Literature Sausage, you know, and it's hard to imagine the audible audiobook version <laughs> of this. Um, what this is, is so wrapped up in its conceptual idea and its particular form. Um, and not so much, you know, it's, it's content. You know, I guess we could eat it and get its content in that way, but even in eating it, you know, it's so wrapped up with the concept and, and the form. So again, showing you these two extremes to kind of make the point that kind of artist books exist more along this side of the spectrum and kind of normal books exist more along this side of the spectrum. But obviously it is a spectrum like, like everything. And so, you know, artist books are everywhere, you know, along this graph. So if you have heard of the term artist books, you might have heard of it because of Ed Ruscha, who is an artist um, who kind of popularized the form in, in the 60s and 70s. Um, but if you're not familiar with artist books, you probably have, and if you either have kids or you were a kid at some point, you've probably interacted with what I would consider artist books. Um, kids books often have really interesting form and concepts that kind of, in my mind, make them artist books. This is a lovely example of a kid's book I had when I was a kid where the pages are cut in, in three and can flip independently. So there is a way to set this up so that it's a rooster or a giraffe or a frog, but if you mix it all up, you get this animal that's a frig. Um, you know, and the idea of playing with concept and form in books is something that's not new. You know, this is a copy of the Elements of Geometry from 1570, which uses these formal kind of pop-ups to, to convey, you know, these geometrical, geometric ideas. You know, this is a, a more contemporary artist making a pop-up with this amazing, um, these photos of this amazing kind of hair swinging dance. And as the pop-up opens, the kind of dance, dance happens. You know, and I have a very broad kind of definition of artist books, and I love the term artist books because it kind of can expand in so many ways. And so the idea here of a book that you can occupy or a book that you can shower within, this is a, a you know, a book as Shower Curtain by, by Dave Edgars. And this is the book as this beautiful sculptural um, um, object. You know, a book as something that you take content, you take form out of to kind of create content. Um, a book is something that you can appropriate other things like taking a newspaper and treating that in a new way. And so I bet, you know, a lot of you have interacted in addition to kids books with things that are, you know, kind of work like artist books that I consider artist books. So if you've ever used an advent calendar 
if you've ever, you know, walked down, this was actually in Cambridge. I don't know if anyone's seen this truck. I was walking around and saw this truck with writing on it, you know, and it kind of, this is, a, this is an artist book. Uh, if you've ever had pills in a pill box, you know, it operates very much like a book where, you know, there's a sequence, there's content. Um, so this term artist book, I find really generative and, and expansive. If you want to learn more about artist books and be bombarded with tons and tons of examples, um, I teach a class on artist books at this place called the Center for Book Arts, which is based in New York, but the classes are all online right now. Um, and I'm teaching one in July if anyone wants to, to learn more. And so the artist books I make, um, I publish under the name Catalog Press, which is a small edition um, press that I, that I founded. And so all the books I make are in small editions and I make them by hand. And they're all catalogs of one form or another. So catalogs of words. This is a Borges short story um, called The Witness, typeset one word per page, each in a different typeface, um, which sort of kind of drastically slows you down as you, you read and you really focus on, on each word. You know, this is a catalog of images, a book called The Details. This is 2000 architectural details, photos I you know, took on my phone over the past few years. Um, then I kind of, kind of narrowed in to the interesting architectural moment that I was hoping to capture and then sorted according to type uh, of details. So, you know, it goes from square windows to circle windows, et cetera, et cetera. This is a book called Stamp Compositions, which is 3000 stamps whose content has been removed. So if there was, you know, a picture of George Washington and something that said five cents, you know, removing the text and image content, and you're just left with these amazing compositions, like stamps as these beautiful formal things, again, then arranged according to type of thing. This is a book um, called 400 People from Detroit, which takes Diego Rivera's um, amazing um, Detroit industry murals and isolates each individual um, person within those murals, presenting them, you know, one per page. And I think there's really a power in isolating and sorting kind of groups of similar content and in, you know, the form of the book to present them one at a time in a way you can, you can focus on. And I think in creating, you know, a narrow focus and presenting content somewhat earnestly, you can pull insights and see things, you know, in, in a different new way than, than you would have otherwise. And I'm also interested, you know, in pushing the idea of what a book can be. So I publish catalogs of objects. So 30 napkins from the Plaza Hotel, you know, 20 Splenda sweeteners, 200 fortune cookie fortunes. Um, you know, I'm interested in ideas of commodification as well. So publishing a book of, you know, money. This is a, a set of books, each containing 192 $1 bills. Um, this is a book containing 77 lucky sevens, which is a scratch off lottery ticket. Um, and so this book, you know, could potentially be worth hundreds of thousands of dollars, but it also could potentially not, not be worth that. Um, I like also having a little bit of, of humor in my work. You know, this is a book of five ketchups. These are five ketchup packets bound together as a book. This is probably my most well-known book um, because people really love American cheese and making fun of American cheese. This is a book titled 20 Slices of American Cheese. And it is what it says it is. It's 20 Slices of American Cheese. I recently also made a book by the same name, um, 20 Slices. This is 20 Slices of Mortadella um, Meat, kind of wanting to play into the Dieter Roth sausage, sausage idea. And so this book is 100% you know, mortadella. And the titling here is actually inlaid fat lettering, just like mortadella is inlaid um, fat and pistachios. And then you know, making books of objects, um, you can make books of books. So this is a book titled 15 Mass Market Paperbacks. It's 15 you know, mass market paperbacks bound together as a book. Then this is 50 mass market paperbacks you know, bound together as a book. And so I came to the Broad with this body of work um, and a proposal to you know, sit into meetings, talk to Brodies, um, absorb as much as I can, and you know, make interesting books that explore and kind of focus in on aspects of the work that, that's happening here. So I started to do this, you know, before the pandemic, you know, sitting in on as many, you know, talks and presentations as I could, you know, from Broad at 15 talks to various program meetings to specific guest speakers. And it was all super interesting, you know, in the program meetings, a lot of the content kind of went over my head, but there was a lot of, a, you know, there was always a nugget of information that I could dive into and look into and research um, and learn more. And I was fascinated by kind of what I saw as one of the core ideas of the Broad's approach to research which I kind of viewed as taking large amounts of data, kind of looking at it in you know, a non-biased way and letting um, you know, interesting insights bubble to the surface. And so I tried to take, like model that um, approach 
and see, you know, what bubbled to kind of my surface as I was kind of looking and sitting in on all of these meetings. And I was also intrigued by ideas of scale and the vast quantities of information and data that, you know, Brody's um, deal with. And I wanted to make books that were really big to show and play with these ideas. So I was also exploring, exploring formally with, you know, how do I make a super, super really big book? And I ultimately kind of settled on the idea of spiral binding, which by figuring out ways to spiral spirals together allows me to make, you know, somewhat infinitely length um, big books. And also, you know, in some ways kind of, you know, somewhat hints at kind of the, the idea of, of the double helix of, of DNA. So with kind of a formal move that seemed promising, I was kind of essentially on the hunt for content. And I kept going to meetings and presentations and seeing what data I might be interested in or be able to collect and arrange and catalog and hopefully present in a way that brought you know, new insights or, or understandings. And so you know, I'd go to all these presentations and watch them on Zoom once COVID started. Um, I started noticing lots of things. Like I noticed like there's all these, whenever scientists are presenting, you know, a study that used mice, they often have a little picture or cartoon of, of mice. So I started collecting the pictures of mice thinking maybe I can, you know, catalog this. It's interesting to see which images of mice, you know, researchers choose. You know, that ended up not to be so totally interesting. You know, I noticed other things like Brody's often use visual metaphors and analogies, you know, cultural shorthands to explain their, you know, ideas and their scientific concepts. You know, from you know needle in a haystack, you know, which lots of Brodies, you know, uh, have used in different ways, to you know using a target to to be a metaphor for things, to you know kind of construction of an automobile as as a metaphor, and so I started gathering you know by taking screenshots of these you know visual metaphors and analogies and emailing Brodies asking for them, and compiling um, as many as I could of these really fascinating ways of kind of explaining science through visual visual metaphor. So this is one of the projects that I'm kind of continuing to work on, and I'm continuing to kind of watch talks and gather um, visual metaphors. And I don't think I quite have a representative sample yet to construct a book. Um, so part of the reason why I'm bringing it up now is if, if any of you Brodies who are listening to this use visual metaphors in your papers or presentations, um, and you'd be willing to share them, I'd love to, for you to email them to me, um, and I'll include them in this, in this project. So another thing I did early on at the Broad was take a tour of the genomics platform. And it was amazing to see the, um, the space where all of this research happens. Um, and one of the things I was struck on, you know, besides the interesting research that's happening is as I was walking around, I noticed all of these machines had, you know, name tags with often pictures next to them. And I thought this was just a really fascinating thing. You know, before I was an artist in residence at the Broad, I never really considered that, you know, labs are just people's offices or they're just places where people, you know, work. Um, you know, I was used to working in an office with a printer or a few printers and each of the printers had, you know, a funny name that someone named them so that you know, you know, this is this printer, this is that printer. And it was so interesting to see that on this mass scale of all these machines being used um, at the GP, they all have, you know, these amazing kind of names pulled from, from culture. And like the visual metaphors, it was kind of almost interesting from the sociological perspective of what you know, characters Brody's you know selected to signify you know their various tools. So everything from you know Game of Thrones characters to Roman emperors to you know planets to you know things from Star Wars um, to Bond villains um, to the Teletubbies to um, like an online comic that I hadn't thought about or watched since middle school. Um, to this was a lot of people's favorite. Um, the Christopher Walken, Walken freezer. And so I find these things, you know, so funny and fascinating and kind of humanizing um, for, you know, because I feel like this is a little bit of the humanity of the people who, who work in the Broad. So I've kind of made it a mission to try and photograph and catalog all of them. This was an early kind of test of what this book will probably look like. I think I have around 400 or 500 images of, of name machines at this point. I'm still kind of going through and editing them. Um, and you know, because the amount is visible, visibly kind of finite, I think I will be able to gather all of them. And so if you haven't seen me around your lab and you have fun named machines in, in your lab, again, you know, if if you'd be willing to let me photograph them, please send me an email because I think I have almost all of them. Um, but I'd love for this to be kind of a complete catalog of all the named machines at the Broads. These are archer characters, um, these are kind of superheroes. So these are the two ongoing projects um, that will result in books. But now I also wanna share with you kind of two artist books that I've completed so far. 
So along with collecting these bits of, you know, almost kind of visual sociological data and gathering them and, and sorting them into a book, I was also super excited to talk to scientists at the imaging platform. You know, someone immersed in a visual world, I was fascinated by the idea of, you know, mining images for information and insights on this super large scale using, using algorithms. And so members of the imaging platform were kind enough to sit down and talk to me about their work. And as part of that conversation, I asked them what, you know, one of the most surprising insights that had come from their research was. And one of their answers resulted in this set of books, which is titled 12,000 Skin Cells. And so it's a set of three books, each containing images of 12,000 fibroblast cells. Um, and the images are a collaboration between the, the Broad and researchers at McLean Hospital, who are all super generous in sharing and talking about their, their research with me. And the reason these images are fascinating is that when analyzed together, um, machine learning algorithms show a, a, in a show statistically significant so machine learning algorithms show a statistically significant difference between the skin cells of people with bipolar disorder or schizophrenia and the skin cells of people without bipolar disorder or, or schizophrenia. And so specifically, um, in mass, the mitochondria of people with bipolar disorder and schizophrenia can be found closer to the nucleus of fibroblast cells. And so this is kind of the intro of this book, kind of showing this idea that each of these images is a picture of a particular cell, um, highlighting kind of the, where the mitochondria are, and showing that in mass, the mitochondria of people with bipolar disorder, with schizophrenia, are found closer to um, the nucleus. And what was fascinating to me, you know, this is just a, in general, a fascinating kind of conclusion, I think. And it's also fascinating that this, you know, conclusion and insight can only be made by looking simultaneously at this large amount of data, like holding all of these images in your mind and holding all these images in your mind and holding all of these images in your mind, which is obviously something that, you know, humans can't do, but with, you know, machine learning algorithms, we can come to these conclusions. So the way this book works is each signature or grouping of pages is a particular patient within the study. So these are all images from this particular patient. And then that's why, you know, these images don't go all the way. And then, you know, um, all the patients are kind of gathered, gathered together. And so in addition to um, by publishing these images in this way, you know, it allows us to have a conversation about this fascinating finding, um, but it also gives some understanding, I think, or, or hopefully gives some understanding about how much data is required for these insights and how impossible it is as a human, you know, to come to these conclusions kind of unaided by algorithms. And so that's this, this book. As I was talking to various Brodies, Another thing I became fascinated with was how cell lines are used in scientific research to serve as models for experiments. And the idea of an immortalized cell line was especially interesting to me. You know, the idea that there are cells from an individual that will kind of proliferate indefinitely as long as, you know, people keep the fridge plugged in and the cells, you know, fed, that these things will go on and on and on. And it seemed like there were a lot of, you know, cell lines in use. And so I was curious about, you know, is there a list of all of the cell lines that are, you know, in use in the world? Or is there a list of all these things? And so I started asking around and a Brody, Brody pointed me to this database called the Cellosaurus, which is a project from the Swiss Institute of Bioinformatics that attempts to collect and describe cell lines used in, in scientific research. So I reached out to them um, and they were super generous in corresponding to me. And I, I learned that their database will essentially never be complete because there are cell lines made by pharmaceutical companies that never get published um, about or shared. There are cell lines used in labs that just for whatever reason never get published. So the total number of immortal individuals is probably something you know, much higher than 60,000 people whose cells have been immortalized. You know, at least twice this is what, what kind of they were saying. And so most cell lines are anonymized and the Cellosaurus collects what data is, is available. And I organized the information and tried to highlight um, the idea of each line is coming from an individual, essentially turning this Excel you know, spreadsheet file into something that kind of had a little bit more humanity into it. So taking you know, each row here is an individual and turning it into this, which is you know, each individual gets essentially this little entry that reads more like a sentence. So this is the content of this book. Um, where we read things that, you know, it, it's kind of set up in the sense that you have the age of the individual when their, their sample is taken, it has their sex, it has the disease the person, you know, had if that was marked, um, 
It has the name of the cell line here, which everything is in alphabetical order of the cell line name. And it has the tissue you know, that the, the cells were sampled from. So you get things like 47-year-old male, 72-year-old male with Parkinson's disease, 38-year-old female with Parkinson's disease. So another you know, metric that's used to describe cell lines um, is population. And so terms used for population vary as the cell source is essentially the scraping together of different databases of cell lines made in different times in different you know, places. So in asking the scientists who compiled the cell source about it, uh, about this, about this population category, they acknowledged how this whole concept of population or ethnicity, or ethnicity is you know, essentially fraught with contradictions and ethical issues and loose definitions. So in compiling this data, and this is something the scientists are trying to grapple with as terms and labels and standards for collecting information about cell lines has changed over time. And I point all this out to say that this data definitely comes with a particular you know, type of baggage in terms of the words used to describe people. And because data on cell lines is anonymized, it's you know, not exactly something that can be easily retrofitted. So I think it's important to acknowledge you know, what is lacking in the way that much of this data has been collected and categorized that there are definitely conversations to be had around you know, ethics and categorizations and when it comes to the words and terms that get baked into these type of, of databases. You know, that being said, having a population category also allows us to see how diverse and inclusive a database of biological material is. Of 60,000 individuals in this book, you know, slightly more than 20,000 of them have something listed in this population category. So most of these cell lines are anonymized, but there are some examples where you know, the name and the story of an individual is known. And so in this book, I call these out with these smaller little, little pages that I work into the, into the binding. You know, Henrietta Lacks, who is a Black woman, is the most famous example of a, a known individual um, because her cells from her cervical tumor became the first immortal cell line. When this happened, you know, neither Henrietta Lacks nor her family knew that the cells were, were taken and that the cell line was created. Um, and they didn't know that, you know, the cells were used in, in all these different ways. And so all this has lots of, you know, obvious ethical implications. And I'm sure, you know, all of you are familiar with, with Henrietta Lacks' story. There's a great book um, called The Immortal, Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks, which kind of describes um, her story and introduces all these ethical implications. And there was also a great um, equity and biomedicine event, you know, honoring Henrietta Lacks' legacy um, that took place at the Broad where Henrietta Lacks' granddaughter and the author of, of this book, The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks, you know, spoke with, with Brodies. And I think that talk is online for, for Brodies to watch if, if they're interested. You know, another famous example of an individual who, who is known is John Moore. Um, Moore's cancer cells, you know, were developed into a cell line that was then patented and commercialized by his doctor and UCLA. And he, um, you know, this, this happened in, in 76. And John Moore sued, you know, UCLA and his doctor arguing that his cells were his property. And the California Supreme Court ruled in 1990 that, you know, a hospital patient's discarded blood and tissue samples are actually not their personal property. And that, you know, John Moore had no rights to, to share in the profits from these commercial products or research that, that came from his cells. So there are some individuals we know based on these, you know, specific stories um, and they're also individuals we know kind of not in the conversation uh, of ethics, but we know because their families decided to publicize or talk about their cell lines. So Christy Thomas is an example of this. Um, Christy Thomas was a, a nine-year-old who passed away in 2006 from neuroblastoma. And I believe her father um, got the opportunity to kind of name the, her, her cell line that was gonna be used to help you know, future patients. Um, and he decided to name it FUNB 2006, you know, FU Neuroblastoma 2006. And they kind of shared the story uh, of Christy. And that's kind of how we know uh, about Christy and why she has a little page, you know, in this book. And so I wanted to highlight the names of these individuals because they are known. And I think it opens up these conversations in respect to, you know, ethics and equity, and also kind of these humanizing conversations about these individuals. And I think it also helps convey the idea that, you know, each one of these 60,000 individuals, you know, is an individual who existed or still exists and who has a story, you know, even if we only know a few of the stories, you know, most of these, you know, individuals are anonymous, um, but they all have, have a story. So 60,000 is a lot. So this book, you know, is this big object and it physically shows this in the way um, 
that you know reading how many rows on your in your Excel document it says you know this many rows, but you know, you don't get a full sense of that um, unless you print it out, unless you kind of hold the physical object. And so that's another aspect of these books that I like exploring is kind of the physicality of you know all of this data. And so I'm interested in these books for their specifics, you know, for the conversations they hopefully spark. But I'm also interested in the idea of presenting data in this physical way, um, because so much of biomedical you know, research today hinges upon analyzing and sorting and understanding these huge quantities of information. So that, that's kind of what I wanted to, to present about the, the books I've been making and continue to make at, at the Broad. I just want to say you know, thank you again to all of the Brodies who have been so generous with their time in terms of, you know, letting me, walking me around your lab, showing me your machines, you know, emailing me your visual metaphors, or just talking to me about your, your research. And then a special thanks to, you know, Shannon, Todd, Nora, Scott, um, and everyone who's kind of helped facilitate my, my experience at the Broad. And then one last pitch for, you know, if you have visual metaphors, or if you don't think I've taken photos of your name machines, you know, this is my Broad email, so please send me an email. And then maybe I'll see people around. I kind of have been camped out in Shannon's office on the sixth floor, which is near the, the Hawk printer. Um, so this is the Hawk printer and where I've been kind of printing and folding and, and binding all of these things. So thanks again um, for, for being here and, and for listening to me. Thank you, Ben. That was so awesome. Um, so we have a couple, we have a couple of um, questions in the chat already. Um, and there's one that um, I, I want to start with is is talk about the scale of the you know while you're while you're here and you've just shown the pictures because it's it's hard to see from a photograph what the scale of those books are. Yeah, definitely. Um, so let me bring it back. So the scale of this book is the pages are this is 14 inches you know tall, um, 14 inches this way. And then you know 4.75 inches this way, and in general, kind of this is kind of eight inches, you know, from from this side to this side. So it's a very big object. It's it was you know legal sized yellow paper that I folded you know in half hot dog style. It takes up a big section of my desk. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and here you can see it on this you know in in progress. Um. So another question about the form of the book. Um, there's a question in the Q&A about the pages, about your decisions about the, what you use for pages, um, you know, the paper versus you know, computer paper versus handmade paper, vellum, um, et cetera. Yeah. Um, and so in terms of the, the paper and the form and the colors, um, let me just pull up image of those books. So I, you know, part of it is in terms of like, I was in this residency, I'm in this residency at the Broad, you know, I'm right next to a printer. So I wanted to use paper that I could print. I wanted to be able to make everything at the Broad. Um, so, and I wanted to be able to make these really big books. So, you know, that's why I'm not using handmade paper because it, you know, it would take too long and this type of paper works, works just fine. Um, but there are decisions in terms of like, I wanted all these books to be distinct in terms of, you know, them as objects. And so thinking about the color of the pages is one way to, to achieve that. And then in, with this one, you know, all of the images in this book kind of look very similar, yet they have these subtle differences between them. And so I wanted the colors, you know, I used to kind of give a little bit of that, you know, intent and content as well, where the books are all kind of vaguely similar in terms of their their color but they do have these these subtle color color differences and yeah the idea of um printing on on vellum is something i'm also very interested in i got some vellum to try um hopefully another book that i might be working on is with some researchers working with kind of murfish and you know identifying cells in situ um and so potentially making a book that you know uses um vellum to kind of see things through through different pages. Yeah, so um, that leads me to a question that I had, uh, which is how do you go about making these decisions about what content you're going to um, you're going to include in a book? Um, yeah, some of it comes from 
um, that process I was trying to describe earlier of just trying to absorb as much as I you know can and then see what either seems like what kind of bubbles to the surface in terms of you know my interests or, or Brody's interests when I'm talking to them um, and also what you know I can gather and, and collect and, and, and share um, like an idea I had initially was um, what if I did this meta publishing project where I found all of the papers published by you know people associated with the Broad, you know printed them out and bound them together as this huge publication, and that I thought was going to be a relatively straightforward idea. But it's actually there is no list of you know all of Broad's publications, um, and you know there's lots of papers behind behind paywalls and this and that, um, and so there's some some of it is you know interest, some of it is what's available and what can I show, and then. Um, some of it also is, you know, there's a lot of time involved in hand making books. And so it's what do I think is going to be interest an interesting result at, at the end. Like, you know, it took a lot of time to print and fold and, you know, bind together this big 60,000 individuals book. But I think in the end, it's worth it because it starts these conversations and it presents these people in this more um, kind of human centered way. Um, and so it's, it's a little bit of that too. But the specifically the numbers, how do you come up, you know, how do you come to these numbers? So 60,000, um, the 60,000 individuals is actually 60,000 individuals, <clears throat> like to clarify, it, yeah. that's the, the record or the cell lines of 60,000 individual people. Correct. Um, and so you, you came, you came to that number specifically because of the, what was in the database? Yeah, so um, in the database, there were a little bit more than 60,000, like just a little bit more. Um, and I came to that number, like, as people probably noticed, like all my books are kind of round numbers. And the reason I choose round numbers is because they're all, you know, it's essentially arbitrary. Um, like the amount that there's, that there's 60,000, you know, 256 in this database, um, that's not the amount of immortal individuals that are in the world. It's just because of, you know, like I was saying, it doesn't capture all of them and these things. So for me, making it a round number um, kind of foregrounds that point that this is not, you know, all of it. You know, this is not, uh, this is an arbitrary thing. And so it seems, you know, it seems less scientific when it's a round number. And, you know, I do that intentionally um, to kind of make that. that that actually leads me to a question that um, that Scott had um, for me while you were talking. Why one hundred and ninety two dollars? So the one hundred ninety two dollar bill book was a specific different thing that was actually made um, for the Whitney Museum gift shop in relation to they had a Andy Warhol show and Andy Warhol has a show has a has a piece called one hundred ninety two one dollar bills where he um, silk screened um, a dollar bill 192 times on this canvas. And that piece was in the show. And so I you know, had the opportunity to make some books that spoke to works in the show. And so that's where, where that came from. So you're referencing an Andy Warhol piece. Yeah, exactly. Very cool. Um, so, you talked a little bit about you talked a little bit about how you um, ab about how you acknowledge the ethical questions um, that came up um, for you when you were putting together, um, particularly the sixty thousand individuals book. Um, how do you how do you negotiate those eth ethical questions when you're you know when you're choosing to include this content? Yeah. Um... I think a lot of it is just the idea of kind of making things visible, you know, like I'm this thing exists, you know, this database of cells, you know, cell lines that have information attached to them exist and are used within the scientific community, whether I make this artwork about it or, or, or not. Um, so I think for me, it's more this matter of kind of earnestly presenting the information in a way that can hopefully start some of these conversations or join some of these conversations that are already happening. Um, and yeah. Um, oh, we have a question. We have a question from Todd Golub. How much of your work um, focuses on catalogs of scientific things? And what about a catalog of scientific ideas? Are these ideas too ephemeral to capture in a physical book? 
Yeah, no, that's a good question. Um, and I guess it's less that they're too ephemeral. Um, I think it's more that in each book, I try and kind of focus in on one thing or I found them to be most successful as kind of conversation starters or, or idea starters or as objects when they do focus in on, on a particular thing. Um, but part of it also is, is a logistical, you know, bit. Just like I was saying, I initially had been thinking about making a book that collected all of the papers ever published by, by Brodies. Um, another thought was kind of making a book that catalogs all of the questions that have ever been asked by, by Brodies, you know, or, or all of the, you know, ideas that have ever been, you know, worked on at, at the Broad. Because I think something like that would be a really interesting object. Um, but it does become this thing that it's a lot harder for me to go out and, you know, make sure I get every single one because that involves, you know, getting all these people to participate and join in and give me their time. And, you know, all everyone at the Broad is super, super generous, but everyone's super busy and stuff. Um, so that's why things like, you know, cataloging every named machine at the Broad, which is something I can, you know, spend my time going to every lab and photographing, and I'm able to get something that's relatively cohesive or, you know, focusing in on a particular project where I can get all of the images and make that, you know, a thing. Um, the idea of, you know, cataloging ideas is kind of a little bit wider, which makes it slightly more difficult, but it's definitely something that I'm open to and, you know, will hopefully do in the future. You catalog one bucket of ideas, not yeah, all the exactly. ideas. <laughs> um, how did you get it? Um, how did you got, get into artist book making and why did you decide to do, why did you decide to focus on science for this, um, for this residency? I mean, obviously, <laughs> yeah. but what, what made you interested in the Broad and, and coming to learn about science and scientists? Yeah. Um, like I studied architecture and visual arts in, in college. And along the way, I realized, you know, there was a job about being a book cover designer in the world where you got to read books and people paid you. And then you got to make the image that, you know, went on them. Um, so I, it was kind of through being a book cover designer and then, you know, living in New York. And because I worked at Penguin and had this tuition reimbursement program, I got to take various classes in my, like, that were related to my work and I worked in the art department, you know, so I got to take like a screen printing class and, you know, work paid for that. And so I took this class at the Center for Book Arts on hardcover book binding. And it was the first time I realized that, you know, this thing that Penguin makes that the company I work for makes that seemed so, you know, impenetrable, like a factory makes this thing. It's just three rectangles, you know, glued to, you know, some fabric and you fold it up and then you have, have your book. And so it became this thing that was accessible to me. And I always liked books for their both their kind of object sculptural quality and also their kind of density of, you know, containing content. Um, and so then I decided, you know, to kind of explore and make stuff and, you know, was lucky that I was on the Center for Book Arts email list and they had a residency program. And so I got the time and the space to kind of start this catalog press project. Um, and I've you know, relatively new to, to Boston. Um, I moved here in the past kind of, I guess it's two years now. My fiance started medical school at, at Harvard. And so when we were moving here, I was kind of looking around at what was going on in Boston and Cambridge, um, saw the Broad. I've always had an interest in, in science um, and saw that there was this you know, artist residency um, opportunity. And so kind of put together a little proposal. I was so excited when it worked out and I got to um, kind of engage with all the stuff that's happening here. A um, little bit more esoteric question. Um, so books also often have a narrative, um, a narrative arc of beginning, middle and end. Um, how, how, do you, how do you negotiate that in the, uh, in the concepts of your artist books? Yeah. Um, yeah, I see the question that Taz, is this like a relevant concept for um, my books? And I guess it's slightly less relevant in terms of the books that I make, which, which operate more akin to like reference books or compendiums, uh, I guess, um, which you can get something from if you read the 60,000 Immortal Individuals book, you know, you would get some story, you know, there and they're in alphabetical order based on what people have named these cell lines. So there is, you know, partially another benefit of having a physical book is, you know, when you're at the middle, you know, so you know, you're at the middle, you know, you're near the end when you're, when you're near the end. So in a physical sense, you know, that, that works, you know, um, but yeah, the books, 
don't totally require, you know, like a novel does for you to read it sequentially to get, you know, what it, what it has for you. It, it allows more of a popping in, um, popping out. So talking about that, the idea of turning the pages um, and reading the story, it, you know, it reminds me, this is a physical thing, right? How does, but these don't look like normal physical books. In fact, a lot of your work does not, I mean, it has the same general shape and, and these particular books that you've made with the spiral bound work in a similar way, but they also are, are the form of them is also kind of different veers off how does that how does this the choices about the form relate to the content yeah um well there's definitely kind of some subtle choices with the the content in terms of like the spiral binding partially because i wanted to make these big books but also partially because it feels somewhat like you know this visual connection to the way dna works um and you know another thing i like about the form and medium of artist books is, you know, people have an understanding of books. Like, you know, right now I have a fake bookshelf behind me, but like Shannon, you have a real bookshelf behind you, it looks like, unless it's a very convincing background. Um, <laughs> good. And, you know, so people have, people, most people I think understand how books work and have a place for them in their homes or, you know, have a shelf that they have a book on or have a table that they have a book on. And so I like that it's this known form. And because of that, it allows me to make some like atypical decisions, like having a book that's really tall or, or having a book that's a different color than what you expect or that opens in a different way. Um, and so I find it freeing to be able to make those decisions because people inherently have this idea of, of what a book is. So it both can kind of fit within their understanding while pushing that understanding um, a little bit. I kind of lost track of what your question was. <laughs> how, does, how does the content, how does the content relate to this, to relate to the decision about form? Yeah. yeah. Um, so it's a combination of kind of these external factors a little bit of um, wanting it to be somewhat unusual in terms of like that's kind of why I decided to you know make them tall tall and skinny um and then also you know in one sense the the length of the books is totally determined by the content you know the amount of images that I make at a certain size determines how how big the book is or the amount of, of names and information about them determines the size of the book and so with the you know with the immortal individuals book um it was you know wanting to make the kind of rules of how that was set up so that you could you could read it and and everything would be, be there. So making it legible, um, it's it's kind of a balance is what I'm saying. Yeah, it goes back and forth. So there's a balance between there's a balance between wanting it to you know um, connect, but also also there's constraints, right? Um, you are yeah. you are constrained with these books with wanting to print them, you know, wanting to print them at the road. Um, on computer paper and wanting to bind them in um, in the spiral binding in that way. Exactly. Um, uh, so you had a <laughs> you had a very um, unusual residency compared to some of the other artists and residents that we've had. Um, there were probably lots of surprises, but can you talk about um, a specific surprise? <laughs> things that the that might have surprised you about about the residency abroad. Yeah, um, lots of you know surprises at like different levels of things. Like the named machines was like super exciting for like a surprise. What I kind of and just that whole idea of you know like obviously people who work in labs are just going in to do you know their work and they have co work. You know, it's just I think being on the outside of a scientific environment, you have this image of like what a lab you know is. Um, and I feel like that image is maybe less, you know, humanistic, like a normal office, you know, vibe, um, and more kind of like rigorous. And I'm not saying like the Broads Labs are rigorous and, and like great or whatever, but I just think there was, there was so much more um, humanity than I expected in like a scientific lab. But I think that's just, you know, my kind of um, previous thinking of having not been in, you know, many labs. And another thing that surprised me was just the generosity of people's you know, time in terms of, you know, an email someone 
um, you know, high up at the broad to ask them a question about um, what, what they do and what their, what their group does. And they would set aside, you know, 30 minutes to talk to me over Zoom um, and share what they do. And then, you know, surprises at the amazing stuff that is happening here. Like, you know, the idea of being able to identify cells using things like Murfish, you know, like in situ without, um, you know, like destroying the, the locality of all these things, you know, the, the ways that people compress all these multi-dimensions of, inf of um, information into, you know, three-dimensional 3D spheres. Um, so lots of, you know, fascinating things to, to learn and, and talk about. And then I guess um, the exciting way to get to that is I would often ask Brody's like, what's the most surprising thing that you, you know, see happening here? And that would always leave, lead me on kind of like a path through, through people to interesting things. Um, we'll, we'll take it. We were more generous with our time than you expected we would be. <laughs> we'll take it. No, I didn't mean um, that in the sense that I expected people to not, it just, you know, this is like, uh, everyone's busy doing, you know, very important, you know, things. And I'm, you know, an artist in residence coming in to, you know, you know make artist books. And so it's just, you know, ever, everyone was just super great. The people at Broad are very passionate about what they do, and they're and they're happy to talk to, to they're happy to talk about it. Um, did you have any constraints due to the pandemic? How did it? How did the the pandemic um, influence your work? Because you were you like the rest of us went remote for a while, um, but you were able to go back on site um, after a few months. So yeah, um, and the you know, it kind of it happened towards the beginning of my, you know, residency. So it was a point where, you know, once all the talks and stuff went online, it, you know, it was actually, you know, easier for me to hop into more of those things, you know, because I was, I was online. Um, and it also, like, I, I had the luckiest chance to be the Broads Artist in Residence during the pandemic, you know, because while people I know were like, trying to figure out the logistics of getting a test and this and that, you know, I was going into the road and I was getting tested. And so it was just so, I felt so lucky to be a, a part of that. Um, you know, the pandemic did influence some of my art making in other ways. Like while I was, you know, stuck in quarantine, I made a book of, I think it was like 300 something pages of, um, of uh, toilet paper of Charmin Ultra Strong. I forget how many <laughs> sheets are in it, but I, but I have a book that's- You were hoarding the toilet paper. <laughs> So I, you know, all of my books are made in, in relatively small uh, editions, small numbers. Um, and I only made one copy of this book because my partner wouldn't, you know, let me use any more sheets of the toilet paper because it was running low. Let me um, um, just, I just pull it <laughs> So this is one, it's one roll, 285 sheets of Charmin Ultra Strong. Perfect. Per, it's a perfect memorial of a lot of people's beginning of the pandemic. Exactly. Um, so um, when will we get to see your book? So I can answer, I can actually answer that question. Um, we are um, at the moment in, in discussion about um, how to display some of these, how to display some of these books for Brody's as we kind of most of us go back on site. So we're thinking in the fall, um, there will be a, uh, an exhibit of Ben's work. Um, some, of, some of his previous works have been, were in the GP, <laughs> um, but they are not there anymore. Um, but we'll be putting up a, a, an exhibit of these books for, um, for Brody's to be able to see. Um, Oh, and another question that has just come in. <laughs> How do you decide when a particular book will or won't reach a successful end and may need to be abandoned? Um, yeah, that's, a, that's a good that's, question. Yeah, I, I think all artists at some point have to either like, you know, go a certain way down that road before they are like, yeah, maybe this isn't a good idea. Yeah. Um, I think like, like a lot of things, I think it's a process of experimentation. 
um, and you know, trying to working through you know ideas. So for each of these books that I you know showed you, they, ne they it's not necessarily that I you know had all of the specifics worked out for how it was going to to come together. You know, especially at the beginning with figuring out trying to. I knew spiral binding could be potentially a way to to make these larger books, but it took a lot of kind of failed attempts and failed directions to find the right way to to connect things. Um, and so I think it's just a matter of you know giving myself enough time to experiment, and explore, to try and make something work or try and pull it together. And then if ultimately for whatever reason physically the thing isn't going to work, or for whatever reason um, in terms of like the stuff I'm gathering doesn't seem like it's you know, interesting enough or, or I can't present it in a way that's different enough to spur a new kind of spark of a conversation, then, then yeah, just like in science, like the conversation says, sometimes things do have to be kind of left aside to, to push on to the next thing. Um, well, I, we have run out of questions in the Q&A. Um, I want to give you, I want you to be able to plug one more time your catalog press website that people can check out and also um you know personally i want to plug your instagram feed because i'm a big fan um <laughs> so um i'll give you a chance to plug yes. your catalog press your website and your instagram feed if you go to catalogpress.org you can see um images of, of all of these books if you click on the images you can flip through you can flip through the pages um, you can see the the Broad books up on top, and then a lot of other books that I've that I've published. And then the Instagram is is Ice Cream Books. If you just look up Ice Cream Books, you can find it. And then you know, as a last plug, if anyone has visual metaphors or knows of named machines, like I think I've got most of the named machines, but I'm sure there's corners of the Broad that have labs that I haven't been in. Um, so I'd love to try and make it a collection of all of the named machines. So. This is my Broad email, bdenzer at broadinstitute.org. Great. Well, thank you so much for showing us and talking to us today, Ben. Um, and thank you, all of you out there, Brodies and non Brodies, who've joined us today and asked a bunch of um, great questions. Um, and um, be looking out, especially on, on the Broad campus, um, be looking out for those uh, an exhibit of the physical books um, coming in the fall. Great. Right. Thanks again, Shannon. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.